this presentation this afternoon represents part of the Chamber's 125th anniversary celebrations. The George Chung Chamber of Commerce and Industry this year uh, celebrates its 125th year since its establishment in 1889. The Chamber is the only statutory private sector body in the country enshrined in the laws of Guyana. It is also probably one of the, probably the oldest uh, civil society organizations. I won't vouch for that, but it's prob it probably is one of the oldest civil society organizations in Guyana. Um, and this year, our team is expansion, meaning that the chamber has come a long way, and we are very proud of where we are today, but we need to redouble our efforts and ensure that we expand and grow our organization. The chamber is a conglomerate or an aggregate of a number of businesses in and around the country, even though it's Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, there's no geographical limitation uh, in terms of our rules when it comes to admitting members into our organization. The issue today has been a very topical one. Um, over the past year, it has generated lots of attention and publicity in the press, in the media, Almost everyone in this room um, are familiar now with the acronyms of CFATF, FATF, uh, FATF, AML, uh, all sorts of acronyms just about a year and a half ago or two years ago, none of us probably would not have been familiar with. Uh, just recently, last week, we saw uh, again the issue playing out very broadly in the press with Guyana being re unfortunately being referred to the FATF uh, international body from its Caribbean counterpart, the CFATF. And who knows what the consequence of that would be, but many are expressing the view that we might be sanctioned black or blacklisted uh, in some fashion. And there's many obvious implications. I won't go into them now. I would let the guest speaker uh, elaborate on that when he makes his presentation. And our guest speaker today is a very erudite and accomplished professional. I, um, I was just telling him, I first heard of him while I was browsing uh, Harvard Law Review. And I, I, re I remember reading about the best paper in finance at the Harvard Law School. and the, um, I think the topic area was uh, canneries, canneries and a, go a coal mine. And I was confused as to what that meant. And then I went to research what it meant. And it's something along the lines of maybe Toussaint might tell you guys. Uh, when the coal miners went down into the, uh, the tunnels, they would walk with these canneries. And they would release the canneries into the coal mine. And if, if the gases were present, uh, and the canneries died as a result of the leakage of any one of those gases, the coal miners knew that they had to turn back or so. Um, but he's very, um, very accomplished. And when I announce his uh, bio and his CV, I will expand on some of his accomplishments. But he's a very respected international attorney banking and banking and finance professional. I want to turn my attention to the current president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I'll ask Mr. Lance Hines to come to the podium to give some brief remarks here this afternoon. Members of the head table, Ms. Juanita Allen, Dr. Boyce, members of fellow business support organizations, media, ladies and gentlemen. Let me on behalf of the executive counselors and members of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry welcome all of you and thank you for taking the time this evening to participate in this very topical, very critical discussion. As mentioned previously, Guyana has been referred to the International Financial Action Task Force for further action by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force because of our continuing failure to pass the required anti-money laundering legislation. 
This continued inability of our representatives in Parliament to reach consensus on critical legislation is most disconcerting to the Chamber. It doesn't all go well for our financial stability, our long-term growth and development, and most importantly, our image as a nation when, where business can be conducted in accordance with the required international standards. The Chamber wishes now to urge our parties to immediately resume negotiations with a commitment to reach agreement for the benefit of all these constituents. We can't get everything we want. We assume that the true nature of politics is about give and take. This must be exercised now. The nation really can ill afford this state of affairs. That said, um, the question now, more fundamental for us, is where do we go from here? Are there consequences? What are those consequences? Are those consequences mildly uncomfortable? Or are we going to experience significant costly delays and related inconvenience? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the genesis of tonight's presentation and discussion. In the coming weeks, if this matter is not resolved, the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry will seek to help clarify and provide information about what this means for businesses and the public. We've heard about catastrophic consequences. We've heard that being debunked. So it is critical that we know exactly what's going on. With that, ladies and gentlemen, like you, I look forward to our most productive presentation and discussion this evening. I hope it goes a long way to providing the clarity that we badly need. Thank you very much. Where would we be without, without our sponsors? I'm proud to say that over the past few years, uh, the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we've been very lucky and our members and especially, they've been very generous in terms of extending contributions uh, that go towards the upkeep and maintenance of the organization. And I can say for the past two years especially, we've done extremely well in terms of reaching out to our members, providing the necessary services for them, and giving back to the community and the country as a whole too many of our initiatives. I'm happy to say that this evening's uh, presentation was made possible completely by the exclusive sponsorship made by Scotiabank Guyana. And I would love to call up the representative here this afternoon, Ms. Juanita Allen, to say a few words on behalf of our sponsor. Thank you. Our guest speaker, Dr. Boyce. President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Lance Hines, the Executive Management Committee of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, members of the business community, special invitees and members of the media, good evening and welcome. The Bank of Nova Scotia is extremely pleased to sponsor the first event in the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry's Distinguished Lecture Series especially in light of the very topical nature of this evening's lecture. Our sponsorship of this particular lecture is born out of our commitment to our corporate social responsibility and as a testament to the bank's recognition of the importance of anti-money laundering and the countering and financing of terrorism, which we recognize as an integral part of the strength and security of the financial sector. The Bank of Nova Scotia, I assure you, has a very robust anti-money laundering program and is committed to supporting the country's efforts to develop the AML CFT regime. We are sure that Dr. Boyce's lecture this evening will be informative and interesting. And we implore you to enjoy um, so that we can make informed decisions in our organizations and also to appreciate where we are as a country in terms of development of our AML program. Thank you for taking the time to be with us here this evening, and we trust that you'll find it was time well spent. I only had five minutes. Um, I think I took about two, so Dr. Boyce, uh, you could have the extra time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. You know, there's a saying in Guyana, we say, um, you know, when you grow up, you want to be like somebody. When I grow up, I want to be like our guest speaker here this afternoon. Uh, when I read his accomplishments now, I'm sure most of you would agree that you also would want to be him when you grow up. Tucson is an old boy 
of President's College. After graduating from that institution, he went on to one of the finest universities in the world, the University of Guyana, where he paid some 3,500 US for a very strong education, world class. And there he read for a Bachelor of Law, Law's degree, and he graduated distinction and was also awarded the Vice Chancellor's Gold Medal for best graduating law student at the University of Guyana. From the University of Guyana, Mr. Boyce went to the U Wooden Law School in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, he performed exceptionally well at U Wooden. Uh, his academic pursuits did not end uh, after he left U Wooden, and I uh, presume he was accepted to the bar in Guyana then. He went on to the University of Cambridge where he majored, again, he did a Master's of Laws, and his concentration was commercial law. There he was a Shivanin scholar, and he also received first class honors when he graduated from the University of Cambridge, and he was also awarded the Queen's College Prize for best graduating law student at Cambridge University. Toussaint wasn't satisfied with a degree at Cambridge. He said, what the heck, you know? Why not apply to Harvard University, which is considered just below the University of Guyana, yeah. but considered one of the finest universities in the world. And he went to Harvard Law School to do another Master's of Laws degree, this time with a concentration in international finance. And he was awarded the program on international Financial Systems Prize for the best research paper. And that's the paper I mentioned earlier, the canneries in a coal mine, uh, competitiveness, complacency in the decline of America's public equity capital markets. Mr. Boyce also holds certifications in anti-money laundering uh, fields and areas. He's a certified anti-money laundering specialist. He's also a member of the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, which is based in the United States of America. In terms of his uh, professional career, he um, worked at Republic Bank Guyana, where he was the manager of the legal and general uh, counsel of that bank here. And then he went on to manage the corporate finance unit of Republic Bank Trinidad on a permanent basis. Uh, Mr. Boyce also held several positions in international law firms dealing with regulations and also dealing with international finance. And only just before I came here, in terms of his academic qualifications, he's now a, a PhD, and that's why we have, that's why we call him Dr. Dr. Tucson Boyce. Ladies and gentlemen, let's raise a, round, a rousing round of applause as I welcome to the podium Dr. Tucson Boyce. Mr. Lance Hines, President of the GCCI. Mr. Clinton Erling, immediate past president, Winita Allen, distinguished guests, members all, all protocols observed, as is often said. Uh, good evening. First, I'd like to start with a disclaimer that the views expressed in this speech are my personal views and are not, uh, sorry, do not reflect those of any university, bank, or other organization with which I'm connected, just to ensure I get that out of the way. Tonight, I'll focus on the foundations for key pillars of effective MLCFT regimes, some key elements to consider in building MLCFT regimes for today and tomorrow, and on the relevant substantive and structural elements to consider in the context of Guyana's experience. I will also, and this is really the fun part, comes right to the end, I'll also have a shot, time permitting as well, at uh, giving you some insight into blacklisting and countermeasures and what really that entails, and some of my own views on that as well. First of all, I'm honored and humbled to be invited to speak to you uh, tonight. I congratulate the Chamber 
on its 125th year of existence. This major milestone has been reached at a time when Guyana is essentially at the crossroads. And I think it, uh, it bears a, a serious recognition, at least in my eyes, that it's been able to last that long. It used to be an unspoken rule, for those of you who don't know, that only the good-looking people were invited to address the chamber. But tonight, it appears to have slipped somewhat, and the floodgates are open. <laughs> the exigency of the topic at hand requires, or rather will severely test, my sort of self-styled aspirations to display certain attributes like brevity and simplicity, simply because it's an extremely complex topic. Pretty dry and boring, and I'll have to do my best to keep you awake. First, uh, please allow me to take a selfie. I'm aware that most of you are here tonight uh, because of the uh, personal curiosity of the recent events regarding FATF and CFATF particularly, and the recent adverse public statement issued against Guyana last Thursday. Last year, I was privileged to be asked by the Bar Association to speak on the topic of money laundering risks for lawyers. Coincidentally, though well planned in advance, the date for that talk fell immediately after the CFATF's first adverse public uh, statement on Guyana. In fact, I think it was two or three days after. And uh, for this meeting, because I was due to be in Guyana for the CDB round of meetings last week, I scheduled with Marissa, uh, I, I accepted the invitation to speak and we scheduled it so that I would be speaking now. The problem is that it also follows on the heels of another or the second adverse public statement against Guyana. So I've pinned this thing down and I realize that every time I'm scheduled to speak in Guyana, there's an adverse public statement issued against Guyana. So I need to break the cycle. And for future speaking engagements in Guyana, I'll probably divert from MLCFT issues and confine myself to areas, to other areas of my expertise like auto-contingent tools for dynamic financial law regulation, using automaticity, biosciences, and dynamic auto-regulation. How does that sound? I know that most of you are familiar with this aspect of what's happening. Oh, great, it's displaying very well. As I mentioned earlier, the timing could not be worse, to me, worse for me, and I was tempted to take the to take the, artful, the path of artful dodging. How many of you remember this? This is Donald Rumsfeld. For those of you who don't remember. Donald Rumsfeld speaking about the concept, that profound concept of known knowns and known unknowns. For those of you who remember that well. As a matter of pure pragmatism and common sense, I will skip over some of the more basic aspects of what is money laundering, what is terrorist financing. I'm assuming that with all that's been going on in Ghana in the last few years, you do know that this is how money is laundered, right? So just for sake of uh, expediting matters, that is the extent of the simple story. Blacklisting and countermeasures, as I explained earlier, will be dealt with below. First, I'd like to show you a shocking photograph. That, ladies and gentlemen, is intended to invoke your sense of patriotism and nationalism. It's a compelling portrayal of a risk to Guyana's borders, a symbol of what is at stake when a country lays claim to the territory of another country. In the worst of times, such a contention is, is, is usually resolved by resort to combat, often to a bitter, long, and bloody war. But when we speak of combating money laundering and, and financing terrorism, we're speaking of a different kind of war. One made of different battles to be waged in the name of the country against silent enemies within and outside of our borders. But we should feel equally passionate about fighting for our country, whether in the first type of war or in the second type of war. Today, countries with non-compliant or, partial or, or partially compliant in effect or ineffective regimes can be shamed, pressured, and effectively conscripted into conforming to globally accepted MLCFT standards and to the building of compliant and effective national MLCFT regimes. Some call it a global war and some call it a game, but it's essentially, in the view of some, a vicious cycle of expensive and elusive compliance uh, that's forced on the smaller countries by the rich and powerful countries. And if you refuse to join, you're asked to take special, uh, you're named and shamed and special countermeasures are taken against you. 
in the name of protecting the international financial system and the integrity of the international financial system from risks that you are likely uh, to generate. Tonight, in outlining the pillars of effective AMLCFT regimes, I will hopefully clarify some of the conceptions and put to rest some of the misconceptions. Uh, first of all, the twin measures of money laundering and terrorist financing collectively spawn some of the most globally complex evolutionary dynamic vulnerabilities and challenges in the modern financial system. Effective networks are essentially necessary to come to the fear that nimble, clever, technologically sophisticated launderers and terrorists, some of whom look pretty much like this guy here, will migrate their illegal operations from highly effective and well-regulated MLCFT regimes in developed countries to less and least well-regulated MLCFT regimes and thus capitalize on the weaknesses that exist in the latter. These steps to combat These steps to combat that type of behavior is of primary concern at the national level. And what we'll find out tonight is that there is no single model for effective implementation. And there are many key elements, but that there are many key elements that are common to all types of effective MLCFT regimes. First, I think it's important that we try to understand the plumbing, what I call the plumbing of the international financial system. And in doing so, it would be helpful to give a bit of background on four topics. What exactly, first of all, is FATF and CFATF? I'll give you that briefly. What are FATF standards, risks, risk assessments, and methodology? The origin and role of naming or shaming or for convenience blacklisting, which is a term I don't like to use, but I'll tell you why I use it. And finally, countermeasures. First of all, the There are really two types of international organizations that bear responsibility for the architecture of international financial law. There are surveillance bodies and standard setting bodies. The FATF is an international standard setter that was established in 1989. Uh, standard setters have broad and diverse membership, including regulatory and lesser extent political actors that are tasked with defining broad strategic objectives for the international financial system. The surveillance bodies include the IMF, and so on, but they also do, at times, perform roles that are consistent with standard setters. FATF says that its objectives, and I'll state them briefly, are to promote the effective implementation of legal, regulatory, and operational measures for combating money laundering, terrorist financing, and this is important, and other related threats to the integrity of the financial system. The last part that I just, that I just mentioned is often lost. The Carbon Financial Action Task Force, as you will no doubt see here, is an offshoot, or what is called a FATF style, or FATF style, depending on how you prefer to, to, to use the acronym, FATF style regional body. That's CFATF there. That's the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. Among other things, FATF and CFATF members, by the way, FATF itself, 